Next, I would like to introduce our esteemed guest from the U.S., technology veteran and founder trustee of Thai Global, Shri Kanwal Rekhi. Shri Kanwal Rekhi is currently the managing director of Inventus Capital Partners, a Sil Silicon Valley-based technology venture capital fund focused on India and the U.S. He co-founded and built Thai into the largest global network of Indian entrepreneurs as we all know of it today. A successful entrepreneur himself, Mr. Reiki has been a venture angel for decades now. He has been involved with over 72 startups, including companies like Exodus Communications, Cyber Media, Activity, and Placeware. His accomplishments are long, and I can't fit them all in here, but I can't think of a better person to give our first felicitation this morning. I request Mr. Kanwal Reiki to please address the gathering. Sir? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is that it? Okay. Well, Honorable Chief Minister, it was inspiring to hear you speak about the entrepreneurship. You know, Kerala has been a mystery to me. You know, it's uh, one of the most advanced states. You know, Kerala is India's future. You know, if we were to achieve the Kerala's human development factors in the rest of India, yeah, we, uh, we would have arrived. But a lowly state like Bihar outgrowing Kerala has to be a shame. Has to be a shame, right? You know, it, Kerala, there's something mysterious here, you know. You know. We need to have some animal spirits here beyond the, beyond the human development factors here. Yeah, they, they are missing. Uh, I've been in the U.S. now almost 45 years and have worked from, you know, with entrepreneurs from almost all parts of India, including Kerala. But, you know, the people I meet from Canada, they just love to have jobs. They love to have jobs. You know, they are very stable, very smart people. And of the 72 people I, you know, companies I invested, only two, you know, a little more than 1% were from Canada, you know. And you know, they, they were very impressive entrepreneurs. But the people from Andhra, you know, there are about a dozen of them in that 72. You know, it's, you know, you know and even Bihar, Loli Bihar had about six of them. You know, in that in number 72. So something is missing here, and I'm hoping that uh, you know, the uh, you know, the people here will have you know, some do some soul searching. Entrepreneurial journey is a very lonely journey. You know, and uh, yeah, any entrepreneur will tell you that he gets very little encouragement from outside. No mother says, you know, son, beta entrepreneur, bono, or beta an entrepreneur." No father says, no father says, you know, yeah, son, you know, your future is your entrepreneurship. You know, they all talk about, you know, you know, settle down, become responsible, you know, uh, you know get a job, you know, you know, uh, there's the emphasis on being, you know, very much of, of a, a stable part of society, you know. Stability has a huge, huge premium, you know, in the family, you know, families in India. And that's true almost every place else. Entrepreneurs, by definition, are not stable. You know, they are restless. You know, they, they don't want to be like anybody else. They want to be, you know, they want to march with their own tune. And even your friends, even your friends, you know, who like to have good time, to see a movie, you know, maybe a ticket match, you know, they get bored because, you know, you don't, you are, you know you're focused on, on your job, I mean, and, and your work, and, you know, and you're, you know, you're working 20, 20 hours a day. And you know, even they abandon you, and uh, spouses, for sure, you know, are very, very unsupportive. You know, <laughs> when you, you know, when you are not bringing home the paycheck, you know, in the early days of entrepreneurship. So it's a journey that you have to sustain from inside. And uh, and you know, the arts of arts are low. You, know, you already heard. You know, maybe you know, one in twenty-five. You know, people will have entrepreneurial gene. Yeah, I think the number is even lower than that. In my opinion, you know, only no more than 2% of the people will become entrepreneur. So it's a low art, a lack of encouragement. It's, it's a great wonder anybody becomes an entrepreneur, right? But here's the, the magic. If you leave your job, if you leave your job and sustain it for six months, you know, to a year, and show the commitment, your arts improve tenfold overnight. You know, instead of being that 2%, 
uh, yeah, chances of succeeding as an entrepreneur, now you have 20% chances of succeeding as an entrepreneur. That's simply because if 90% of the people don't even try, they don't even take that first step, and you become part of the select 10% who take that first step. 20% odds are not that bad odds, you know, if you start to see the returns, you know, if you succeed, you know, you're set for life. You know, you do make more money, you know, than, than you know, many people imagine possible. So the, you know, the odds are very much in your favor if you were able to sustain that you know, first step. But uh, many, many people you know, have trouble, you know, taking that first step. And, you know, with no, no family support, there's no wonder. So I tell people that... There are really no limits to, as to what you can achieve or what you should be able to achieve except for the limits that you place on yourself. You know, you know, if you start to talk about, you know, you know, I can't do it, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, it's, it's lonely, you know, you know, the opportunity cost. You know, if, if you're making good money, giving up your, your paycheck, you know, you know, these are huge hurdles you know, to, to overcome. But these are the limitations that you place on yourself. And then nobody from outside is going to ever tell you to become an entrepreneur. Nobody is going to give you a chance to become an entrepreneur. You know, that has to come from inside. You have to give yourself a chance to become an entrepreneur. And like Ashok Rao mentioned earlier, this entrepreneurial gene or entrepreneurial virus that he's, yeah, he talked about, if it, there is such a thing, it's randomly distributed. It's absolutely randomly distributed. The fact that your parents were not entrepreneurs doesn't mean anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fact that your parents are entrepreneurs doesn't mean anything either. You know, this, you know, this gene works you know, from inside, and you have to see you know, for yourself if you have that gene, you know, and, or if you have that virus. And you know, so I tell people that uh, it's not a shame that you will fail as an entrepreneur. You know, if you, and most entrepreneurs will fail at least once. It, it will be a shame that if you don't even try. Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's the, the model you have to have. You have to give yourself a chance you know, to become an entrepreneur. And failure is you know, not a big deal. You know, if you fail once, you know, it's like uh, trying to learn to ride a horse. You, you will fall, uh, and, and that's the nature of the beast. But you get back on the horse, you know, and pretty soon you master the whole thing. And, and that's, that's how the whole process works. If 2% of the Indian population becomes entrepreneurial, and on average they create you know, maybe 20 to 25 jobs, almost all the problems of India are solved. And that's the number in the U.S., by the way. Two percent of the population in America is entrepreneurial. So people ask me, what's the difference between an entrepreneur and a manager? Yeah. Isn't a business manager an entrepreneur? Yeah, the, well, yeah. Here's the thing. Yeah, the managers learn to manage assets. You know, businesses have employees, they have inventories, they have factories, they have customers. These are all assets. You know, a, a manager's job is to, to manage these assets as efficiently as possible, maybe improve the productivity efficiency by 5%, and, and you know, streamline the whole thing. That's what the many managers do. Entrep you know, so managers are into stability, streamlining, improving efficiency, productivity, and uh, you know, a wonderful thing to have for the society. Entrepreneurs, on the other hand, are absolutely you know, you know, different. You know, they are innovators. They don't like stability. They like to disrupt things. You know, they like to come up with a new method of doing things. Ten times better. Five percent improvement in productivity is wonderful for a manager. Five times the improvement in you know, productivity is not enough for an entrepreneur. He wants ten, ten x is the mantra. And so there's this, this notion of, uh, of uh, a new way of doing things. You know, totally you know, you know, something which hasn't been tried before. You know, innovation you know, is a much used word. But some kind of... Uh, you know, a creation of new technology, maybe even development of new technology, you know, is what, uh, what entrepreneurs uh, like to do. So entrepreneurs are very, totally, you know, uh, unstable, indisciplined from, from an average person's life, you know, uh, uh, mind, you know, but, but they're absolutely you know, they are dynamic in their approach. And so society needs both entrepreneurs and, and managers. You know, the entrepreneurs are the ones who create new opportunities, new jobs, they add dynamism, in society, yeah, and managers on the other hand add stability and, and productivity, and they conserve and preserve the wealth which have been produced, and to produce, and to produce new wealth. You need both of them in society. Yeah, a healthy mix of uh, managers and entrepreneurs is required. If society becomes very managerial, it becomes very stable and very stagnant. And the, you know, the prime example of that is Japan. Japan is a superb managerial society. 
and it's been very stagnant for 20 years now. Japan has shown almost no growth whatsoever. Society which becomes very, very entrepreneurial with no managers at all is like Nigeria. It's very unstable, <laughs> you know. It's very unstable, you know. They, you know they, they never preserve and conserve any wealth. But a healthy mix is required. You know, the you know, U.S. is the private jump on the day. And uh, I think India is vitamin, you know, like U.S. in many, many ways. It, it, I just wanted to you know, talk about the, 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 the thing that I should mention about DOT, Hatao, Desh Pachao. How many of you remember when the Telegram policy changed on the January 1st, 2001? Yeah, I, I don't know if any of you know the reason why it changed. It, it was a very abrupt change and it was overnight and, and nobody, you know, India never looked at. Back in 1998, I think, you know, when uh, you know, Bajpayee became the, uh, the Prime Minister first time, he gave a speech, you know, that I, I listened to in Delhi, and his speech was, IT is India's tomorrow. And I scratched my head, he said, hey, mm, does he really mean it? So I requested a meeting to go see him, and, you know, and my request was granted. So I saw him for about 10 minutes, and I said, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm very impressed with your speech, you know, IT is India's tomorrow. And, and do you really mean it? He said, yes, you know, this is our future. I said, well, then you'll have to do two things. The first thing is you'll have to do something about this telecom infrastructure that we have in India. You cannot build your future, you know, on this third world, third rate, you know, telecom infrastructure you have. And he said, hmm. So, you know, he, you know, he spoke very few words in Hindi. You know, he told me, what are you doing? You know, tell me what, what we should do. And, and then I said, you know, the other thing you have to do is, you know, you have to let the entrepreneurial thing happen in India. You know, you have to, you know, allow the venture capital to happen in India. And he says, yeah, yeah, soon we are. I, I, I have heard you. And then he, you know, then I was dismissed. So as I was leaving, I said, you know, the, the chief minister and uh, chief, uh, the PMO, uh, chief secretary, I think, I don't remember, you know, you know he was the, you know, the main person at the, at the PMO, he, he says, the yeah, president is telling you that he has heard you and tell us what, what we should be doing in more detail rather than, you know, just, you know, just one line. So I went back to the U.S. and I organized you know, at Stanford University a conference on what India's telecom policy should be. And we brought experts from all over the world and we analyzed the 13 liberalizations that had taken place. A year later, we brought them back to India and I went to present them to the Telegram Minister, Mr. Ram Vilas Paswan. And he says, yeah, this is what we have done. And he looks at me and says, why are you wasting your time? I says, oh. He says, you know, if you want to help India, you need to help us solve one problem we have. I said, what problem is that? He says, population problem. I says, but you are not the Minister of Population. You are Minister of Telegram. Why are you worried about population problem? He says, well, you know, if you want to help us, you, know, you need to worry about that one, not about this thing. And I said, well, I thought the uh, Prime Minister wanted me to spend some time. He said, besides, you know, Teritam is a national defense issue. We can never liberalize that one because that, uh, that would impact our national defense. I said, you're not a defense minister either. You know, you're a Teritam minister. And he said, well, you're wasting your time. So I came out of that meeting with the, with the you know, Minister of Teritam, Ram Vilas Paswan, and I wrote, I gave an interview to Time, you know, Times of India. And the headline was DOT Hatao Desh Pichau. You know, get rid of the DOT department, you know, and save your country. And I, I wrote that, you know, op-ed, and I went back to U.S. The next day, I got a phone call from Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister wants to talk to me. I said, I've come back in U.S. already. He said, can you come back? So I took the flight back to India the very next day. I was there only one day. I came, you know, I went to see the Prime Minister, and he says, why did you write that editorial? I said, well, you know, I spent one year, you know, you know, you know and you know, brought all these people from the other world, and you know, we had some policy determinations. And he said, oh, you, you know, what happened? I said, I went to see your minister, you know, up title, and he told me that I was wasting my time. And uh, so he, you know, you know, therote sumlia, I mean, I heard you. And, and, then I, and then I was dismissed. I said, you brought me back from the U.S. for that, you know, five minutes, ten years? And so as I was living, you know, the Mr. N.K. Sin, who was the, you know, the main man at the PMO, he says, he has heard you and you, uh, you should see something, you should expect some changes. The next day, he removed Ramidas Paswan as the Minister of Taitam and he put Pramod Mahajan, 
you know, as a minister of CARICOM, and they adopted all the recommendations we made. All of them we made, and that was uh, in summer of 2000. So, so very few people know that even if one person can make a difference. And the policy was adopted, you know, in, you know fully back on, uh, on January 1st, and within first year, they had 10 million phones installed. Uh, yeah, coming into that year, there were already 1 million uh, mobile phones in India, and 17 million landlines. This is, this is the, at the end of 2000. By the end of uh, 2001, there were 9 million uh, uh, cell phones in India, and 17 million landlines. And 10 years later, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are close to 800 million uh, cell phones in India. Uh, you, know, you know how many landlines we have in India 10 years later? 34. 34 million. It's, uh, they have doubled in 10 years, but the, the cell phones have grown 800 fold. And you know, it, it, that's where the policy uh, thing comes into play. The entrepreneurial you know, activity in the telecom sector is phenomenal. You know, it has you know, produced huge amount of jobs without any money being spent by government of India. Without, as a matter of fact, the you know, government of India has had a huge tax you know, benefits. So you know, we need to become very, very focused on, on removing the any and all obstacles. And that rid of this thinking, you know, this is a defense matter. Uh, this, uh, the population is our problem. Population is not our problem. We have the smartest you know, people in the world. You know, po you know, population density-wise, Japan, Germany are more dense than India. Uh, on population density-wise. You know, so how can that be a problem for India? I just want to mention you know, that the problem of India is poverty. The solution and antidote to poverty is always, always the new wealth not the distribution of the old wealth. If you distribute the old wealth, everybody will become poor. You need to create more wealth. And the only reliable source of more wealth, unless you have a lot of oil, is entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reiki, for your inspiring words and for showing us that one person can make a difference. Thank you again.